York Times just sent me an update. She's like, hi, David. Just wanted to send an update. It's been a while since we talked, and I didn't want to leave you hanging. It's the status of the story. She said, I'm trying to get Zach George to talk to me, but haven't had any luck so far. She said, do you happen to have a secret dog trainer contact info for him by chance? <laughs> So what I'm going to do here in a minute is I'm going to bring him on in uh, to start. My only expectation of him is just going to be get his wiggles and stuff out of his system. I just don't want him jumping or anything. Okay. So uh, you can pat him and stuff. Just keep it like a little calmer. You know, don't get him super wound up, obviously. And then once he kind of chills out, what we'll do is we'll start jumping right into some training and stuff. He said, are we home? Hey, Hold on, dude. <laughs> said it's been so long he was very social and playful with the other dogs and stuff he did really good with that yeah yeah, yeah. did good on his walks and all that good stuff <laughs> first week i was thought everybody would keep nice and slow there's not gonna be any crazy huge expectations of this first week we're gonna give you a couple really easy things you could work on with him to keep him successful and then in our follow-up session that we do next week that's really where we kind of get into a lot of the the super nitty gritty stuff. He's very responsive to like correction and stuff. Like if you tell him not to do something, like he, he, he really takes to it nicely. Like you don't have to tell him very many times. So that was definitely a positive as we were working with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was just our little ball T of anxiety. Typical Wheaton, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so we thought maybe. Yeah, I mean, obviously, and we, we talked about this when you guys dropped him off. Like he's definitely an anxious guy, right? Yeah. But uh, he controls it nicely. Like it doesn't really ever pose itself as a big issue, you know? And as you start to address some of the things like the reacting out the window, right? Mm -hmm. And giving a little bit more direction when people are coming over and all of those types of things, you'll notice that that will continue to get even better at home for you all right so we're gonna start getting into some stuff here since he's kind of chilling out nicely um, we're gonna start off by working on the bed stay a handful of times um, should be pretty straightforward we saw everybody first handful of repetitions and everything generally getting back into the house around you and stuff might be a little sloppy no big deal if that's the case we'll help him through it as we need to and we're not going to be uh, being super hard on him to start here i just want to help him kind of acclimate to doing this stuff in here so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to walk him straight on up to this bed Tell him, Finn, bed. And my expectation is just that he gets onto the bed. So he doesn't have to sit or down or anything like that. He just needs to be totally on the bed. No, Finn, bed. If he steps off, I'll just mark with no, help him all the way on. Come on, bud. He's like this one. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Then we'll release him off. And then we'll do that a couple of times until he starts realizing that this is the same thing as the other ones. Exactly. He should stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like the primary use for it. So like if anybody comes over my house, generally speaking, for the first like 10 to 15 minutes that they're there, I have my dog situated into bed stays. So what it does is it two things. One, lets him get kind of acclimated to the new people there before we have him interacting and stuff mm -hmm. in a controlled way where there's some accountability for you got to stay there and stay focused on me, not the other person. Um, and two, it lets the energy level just kind of settle down for a minute. Uh, before we go to to release him and let him interact. Now I notice your commands are very like calm and relaxed. Super simple. So the intensity of how we're giving commands is totally irrelevant, right? They're just cues. They signify to do a certain thing, and they're not inherently to like enforce the command, right? Meaning, like if he didn't get on the bed, I wouldn't say bed more firmly. Okay. That's what my correction is for, right? Okay. So let's say hypothetically. He was really distracted because somebody was at the front door here right now, and he broke it and just mindless, didn't care, right? I could just increase the intensity with my e-collar and just give a more firm correction, which will actually clearly tell him that he made an incorrect choice, more so than me being more firm with my words, okay. right? Another big part of it, too, is especially in the heat of the moment when the dog is not listening and there's a lot going on and stuff, when we're getting all frustrated and yelling commands more intensely and stuff like that, we're not thinking as clearly, and generally our timing kind of goes out the window sure. of stuff, you know? So I try to stay super calm and relaxed as we're giving and enforcing commands with things. There we go. We got it. <laughs> Hello? Come on in. Don't mind our dog over here. He's training. That's pretty good, Finn. Hey, 
Okay, he's doing pretty well. I'll take it. All right. Good work, buddy. Okay. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna start off just really easy bed stays here. So I want you to walk them all the way up to the bed. Once you get about two feet away or so, come to a stop, tell him thin bed one time. If he does it, great. If he does not do it, you're gonna mark with no, then help him onto the bed. Thin bed. And the expectation with bed is just four paws on, so that looks great. So go ahead and set your leash down and then walk away. And no crazy distractions just yet here. Just get him used to you walking around and stuff. And each repetition we do, we're kind of looking to see him settle into. So obviously he's standing right now. We'll wait until either he sits or downs. And then we will uh, go grab him, release him, and do another one. There we go. Looks pretty good. Why don't you go ahead and go back to him. And what you're going to do is pick up the leash, but don't release him yet. Okay. So I want to make sure that when we go and grab that leash, he doesn't see that as the cue to get up. We want to see that he's nice and stationary there. Now you can tell him okay and release him off. Okay. Perfect. And then just do a little loop around and then you can do another one. Yeah. <laughs> no ding dong this time. Yeah, no. It'll probably come eventually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and this is honestly like what we're working on right now. One of the biggest things you're going to be working on this first week with him okay. is just getting him used to like long bed stays around all sorts of different distractions, yeah, well, we'll especially once the kids are, you know, and stuff. So, we'll have plenty of that. <clears throat> yep. And whatever a real life distraction is going to be, I mean, you know, if the kids are running and playing and, and, and having a good old time and stuff, okay. obviously that's a great distraction to work through as well. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> And then obviously, okay, it's just a release. All it means is that we're done with what we were just working on. So like right there, he kind of hesitated on the okay. Totally fine. At that point, just encourage him off okay. or whatever you need to do. How is he with things like um, the vacuum or anything like that? He will growl and get fired up at the vacuum. I, I, he will. I have that pretty well stopped. Okay. Um, but we can definitely try that. See we'll that. test that here next. <laughs> I'd say it looks pretty good so far. So what we're gonna do next is we're just gonna add a couple down stays in. Sure. It's gonna be the same exact concept. The only difference is we're doing a down position so we could do it in multiple different places. Okay. Now I wanna be aware that I'm not doing it too close to the bed mm -hmm. to confuse him. Cause generally speaking, we wanna create like a radius around the bed where if we're within like six feet of it or so, he kind of just understands to go to it. So I'll be kind of keeping my distance from it as we go. So then down, Let's give that down command. All the way, wait out for a minute. <laughs> Good. And then once he gets all the way into it, drop that leash and leave him. Just like with the bed, first handful of repetitions with the down, speed is not my priority as long as he gets into it. Now I didn't repeat the command obviously, but I did give him a couple of seconds to process it and figure out what it is we wanted him to do. <clears throat> Yeah, you can do them on your walk. You can do it if you're in Home Depot with him. You could do it throughout the house. Yeah, wherever you need to. Yeah, yeah, right? Same deal, picking up the leash, making sure that he's staying in position. Okay, then I'll release him. We'll do another one. Come on, bud. No. Oh, there we go. I got a person there. Fin down. No. Down. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Nonetheless, you'll notice when we gave that no marker, it snapped him out of it right away as soon as you noticed, which was fantastic. Sure. 
sure, sure. Well, and the reason why the no marker is like so valuable to him right now, we'll call it, is because it predicts a correction coming, right? Right now, because we're kind of easing him into this, I'm not actually giving a correction, sure. right? But generally speaking, let's say you ran into that same situation tomorrow, right? And he's a little looser, he's kind of in the groove with things and stuff at home. We would follow up that no with an actual correction on the e-collar, which would really actually snap him out of it then at that point. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a lot of the reason why I don't like like things like some of the in invisible fences or some of like the automatic like bark collars and stuff like that that have that tone first is um, for some dogs, not all dogs, but some dogs, that tone is too similar to things like your microwave or noises on your phone or like any of those types of things. His yeah, yeah, yeah. Stays open yep. Long, and it'll send him into a tailspin. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And, and the thing with the beep is, right, so like if we were to use a collar that had a tone to it, right, the tone itself is not the correction. The tone is the marker, right? So we're using, so we're using a verbal marker, yes, instead of a tone. He's hearing the no and he's not getting, I mean, he's not going into it. Yeah, so. yeah, and it's a balance, right? Like, so the e-collar, it's not like it's set at one level all the time, right? It's got 100 levels to the thing, right? So I could get away with a really, really low level, like basically we've been able to work at so far this entire session because he's pretty focused in, but let's say he was in more of a frenzy because he was worked up because somebody was outside. Sure. I could work at a higher level, right? And it's, it's, it's more adjustable so that we could adjust it based on him so that it's the appropriate level every time as opposed to him constantly being like, it's going to be this terrible thing that happens every single time I hear it. You know what I mean? Where an invisible fence, again, it's always set at that same level at that point. Pin down. And give him a second. Let him process that. Work through it. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I could get him to do all the stopping and staying, but sure. I had to be looking if I looked Yeah, yeah. We've never gotten super crazy with eye contact. Eye contact comes naturally as the dog cares about what you're asking them to do. Sure. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's never an expectation necessarily, but it's obviously nice when he's looking to us for direction. Mm -hmm. But that's just coming because he knows that generally, if he doesn't listen, obviously there's some sort of consequence. And historically, as we've been working through the early training with him, there was rewards for doing things correctly, right? <clears throat> He doesn't like treats. Yeah, he was a little bit here and there motivated for them, but oh. not not over the top by any means. Yeah. Let's go in the back. That's a very distracting one. Let's do it. There we go. A lot of times we'll see that with the down because historically in the house, we ask sits a lot out of the dog, mm -hmm. right? So that's their strongest behavior. So he sat sure. thinking like, wait a minute, this is usually correct. So you just got to wait him out for them to try the next thing. Try something distracting. Not too shabby, bud. I don't want to yell, like, do I tell him, like, good from here, or do I wait until I get wait up here? Wait until you get next to him. Keep it real calm with that stuff. I want to just yell him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ooh. Now, right there, it's fine, because um, he got up technically when he said okay, but you see he was jumping the gun. Yep. And that was the importance of making sure you pick up that leash and pause before releasing still. I try to do that anytime I'm doing commands on the leash. In these early stages of training, I would prefer you be almost a little over the top with how long you're waiting like we did there to give him that chance to do it um, before you give that no marker, obviously. Because if he were hypothetically like thinking about it right there, he's like, wait a minute, I'm not sure what to do. Well, I think I should lay down. Too, yeah, know, so. no, different picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if he were in the middle of thinking about doing it and getting ready to start laying down mm -hmm. and we marked with no too soon, we could accidentally inhibit some of that process of sure. you know problem solving on his own. What's the time frame that he should stay down? Sure. Like this, like yeah. a minute, two minutes, five minutes? Way longer than that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we've done like up to like an hour with him. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. If I put him somewhere, he should stay there. Yeah, obviously right now you need to be there to supervise Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And he'll probably make a mistake or two along the way. But, you know, yeah, if I'm doing office work or something like that, I'll put the dogs into a bed stay or a down stay or something okay. and have them hold that for as long as I need to. Mm -hmm. I've done, I mean, with my dogs at this point, like when we go back to, my wife's from Connecticut, we went back to Thanksgiving two years ago, took two of our dogs. They probably held almost a three and a half hour long bed stay while we were doing dinner and stuff. So, 
<laughs> it's no different than him being in the crate for a long time. Yeah, you know? it's better. Yeah, because <laughs> you know? yeah, he's thinking, right? He's still able to be a part of everything. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. Generally, for the longer ones, if I have the ability to, I like to do a bed instead because it's a little more sure. clear for them, a little more comfortable for them. Uh, yeah, so for the first week, generally I say about 30 to 40 minutes a day, and it's going to be broken up into three things. So you're going to do one long bed stay a day that'll be like 30 to 45 minutes. Sure. You'll do one short training session where you just work a little bit of everything, kind of like what we're doing right now. You pick something, like maybe you want to work the front door, right? Or the kids running around playing or something like that. Uh, and then you're going to do one structured walk that could be as short or as long as you want it to be. Past that though, you know, after that first week or so, I always tell everybody, it's not that you're sitting down and designating time to working with things. You're just adjusting some of the things you're already doing. And you're just doing that yep. instead of... So it's like if you have people come over, like you're going to implement your 20 minute bed stay at the beginning of it, right? If you're going for a walk, you're going to do it this way, stuff like that. Okay. Perfect. So are door thresholds a thing? Yeah, so generally speaking, you'll see like, we enforce our walking as not so much a heel command or anything, but we call it the come command. So come is our universal come to us, but also stay with us, right? So generally as I'm going through doorways, I don't get super crazy as far as looking at the doorway as something different, right? It's not like because I'm at a doorway, I need to now suddenly work on this weight or sit or this or that. I just continue to enforce my come command, meaning when I open that door, you're still in come, you still have to be next to me, right? So I expect them to just stay with me and then just walk through with me. We don't get crazy with like, oh, people have to go through first or anything like that, so. So reactivity, I always say, comes down to us being more proactive than reactive to the dog, right? So generally, if you've hit a point where your dog is full on blowing up at another dog, you've missed a bunch of signs leading up to it, right? Because usually what'll happen is they'll go through like a sequence of escalation, we call it, where he'll first kind of lock onto the people, then he'll start pulling just a little bit over towards them, right? Then that pulling will turn into him hitting the end of the leash and starting to whimper and whine. Then it'll turn into barking, et cetera, et cetera, you know? It's not even so much about letting them calm, but like it's a good structure to implement so you can get yourself situated, sure, yeah. get your coat off, get your shoes yeah, off, all that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anything you do, I try to set like routines, right? So because where most people go wrong with like long-term success of training is they do all of this stuff for like a month or two months or whatever it is. And then you can't maintain, it's too much, right? It's unrealistic to maintain later. So if I have clear routines for a couple of things that forever and ever for the end of time, I'm going to enforce things in A, B or C, D way, right? Um, I know that I can be successful with that, right? And I'll never kind of slip up. You know, another example is like use of the e-collar, right? Like obviously for the first couple of weeks, he's going to have it on pretty much all the time when you're out with him. But long term, there's places you need it and there's places you don't need it, right? Some people will fall into the trap of they just stop putting it on altogether and then the dog's behavior starts slipping we'll over time. Out, but it's not the reinforcement goes away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everything is contingent on consistent reinforcement. So what I do with my dogs is I set three places where I'll always put the e-collar on, right? So if I have people come over my house, mm -hmm. if we go anywhere public so really anywhere if I leave the house to go on a walk or to the park or anything like that or if we go off leash anywhere those three places I'll always put an e-collar on and because those three places are the places where if my dog's going to blow me off it's going to be in one of those I'm never really caught off guard with stuff at, at least a pull you need a response yeah to me, to me. and like I said the, the catching it right away right just super proactive about where we're giving that correction that's the most important part. And like you talked about, like with the beeps and stuff, like it's not like it's this long, like lasting, he's petrified or anything like that, because it's predictable, right? He knows how to avoid it, which is the key with corrections. He has to learn how to we call it like, win the game, right? Now, when you're getting more strict with him, you yep. mark with no and correct right away, but on a, a lower level or? It, it depends. The level will fluctuate based on what's going on in the environment, right? So right now, we're much higher than we've been at for anything else because these are his big distractions. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
uh, where in the house there wasn't a ton of distractions going on, so we had it lower. But let's say you had a gas coming over, right? You'd probably have to be just as high, right? And when I say high, like this goes to 100. Right now we're at about a 50. So now there's sometimes he needs to be higher than that. There's sometimes lower, you know? And you can see he's really like relaxing into a comfortable position with you. Like that's kind of your default. You want to like take a picture of that and just have that what you're striving for at all times. Will he get tired? With, is, is there too much training? And what, why I'm asking that is because I'm disappointed my wife couldn't be here now. Sure. Should I do the same thing you and I, I understand. with her? So um, there's not really a too much from the standpoint of long commands. So let's say your walk, right? Like there's times my wife and I'll go for a two hour walk with our dogs and they'll be healing the majority of the time. Uh, or like I said there, we did the three and a half hour long bed stay, right? But you could overdo it sometimes with the repetitive commands, right? So if you're doing like 17 downs, right? Or beds or whatever it may be. Um, I try to not do too much of that. Uh, but you can do some easy stuff with her right off the rip. But you're gonna find like once I leave, like probably about 45 minutes after I leave, he is gonna crash and he's gonna stay crashed for like three days. <laughs> so, um, so I always say keep the first like 24 hours or so real easy on him. You know, obviously set your boundaries and correct him if he does stuff you don't want him to do. But don't get super wild with asking a ton of things out of him. We don't need the positive reinforcement anymore because he's already got this stuff figured out. <laughs> it's it's not that we don't want to do it or it's wrong to do it. Like if he was super food motivated, hell yeah, like yeah. give him some treats for doing it, you know. Um, but he's it, it, sometimes with a dog like him, you wind up wasting so much time trying to get them to want the treat. Sure. Uh, when it's just not necessary, you know? The act of doing it becomes reinforcing for the dog, right? So as you do this, like you're saying the walking, right? The mental aspect of he's getting a physical exercise right now, but also mental exercise, that's fun for them. Like they enjoy that, you know? Um, but yeah, pretty straightforward. Like I said, homework assignments, I really want you putting most of your emphasis in the house into your bed stay. Um, that obviously practice quite a bit and just bring out whatever type of distractions you can to make sure that obviously he's listening with it. Um, out on your walk is gonna be your second biggest priority with things. And you could work some of your downstays. You can do those inside or outside based on what the weather is like, obviously. Now, outside of your commands that you're doing with him, let's say, like obviously a large chunk of your day, 22 hours or so, he's just gonna be hanging out, right? He's not gonna be in command, he's just gonna be existing. Um, if there are things he does you do not want him to do, don't use commands to get him to stop doing that, just correct for it. Okay. So let's say, like you said, the, the barking out the window at stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's say he runs over there, he starts freaking out at the window at something. I wouldn't tell him bed, I would tell him no, turn my level up a little bit, and then give a tap on that, right? And we wanna see that that correction snaps him out of that thing that he's doing right there. And then same with, uh, you know, when your wife gets home, he may try to jump on her, right? Mm -hmm. Be ready to correct for that if you do, or with the kids, or, or any of those types of things. <laughs>
a case like you just described or 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 we'll see it where you know somebody goes and like if you go and like pick up your wife or or things like that it's just a weird kind of like high energy situation that dogs kind of want to go and control you know and again it's not that they're trying to attack or anything like that but you definitely will see a lot of those controlling behaviors of the jumping or the nipping or, or whatever it may be so and those things you know generally speaking those are big time just training related issues. You know, we need to have the communication established to help guide her in those situations and communicate when she's doing stuff we like or what we don't like or give better direction through situations that might stress her out, you know. Outside of that, any other big uh, situations or, or, or issues you see in the house with her? She's not the best behaved dog just in general. She's, I mean, she's sure. really smart. Yeah. Like, we've trained her to do some things. She's a barker yeah. and that that is really annoying. She just barks for attention and to, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just really irritating. Well, I mean, the, the situation sounds pretty straightforward. I mean, generally when we have a dog that is a little wild, a little out of control in the house and stuff like that, we see it just kind of compound on itself and start turning into these problems where, again, it's not that the dog is intentionally trying to be aggressive, but because this dog is used to kind of getting its way with certain things or reacting at things or whatever it may be, now that it's running into scenarios where whether you guys or the daycare workers or whatever are trying to intervene and stop her from doing so, she's basically just telling you that she doesn't like that, right? Um, so training and getting her out of that state of mind uh, is, is really the solution for this. I always say those those incidents you're describing to me are much more the symptoms than they are the actual problem. Maybe we didn't. I don't know. It's... I'm not sure we've conveyed that she does seem to go after people sometimes, too. Not in our family. Mm -hmm. Like, if we're out for a walk, if someone gets too close to her, she will definitely try to bite. No, I understand. So is she, like, let's say you're out for a walk with her and somebody's walking on the other side of the street, not paying any mind or anything like that. Is she reacting at people in those situations? Just like outwardly, just she sees somebody, she's got to bark and try to make them go away, or is it only if they try to approach her? So it, it, it's sort of, if, if it's just a, well, she, she does have a type, um, mm -hmm. and she's most likely to be aggressive towards white women, particularly mm -hmm. black women. So if there's another dog, yep. um, like, then uh, her primary focus will be on the dog. She's totally fine. Yeah. If, if the person walking is across the street, mm -hmm. um, it's not an issue. If it's on the same sidewalk, same side of the street, then I'm going to hold her leash tight and um, you know, step you know, a few feet into the grass so that the other person can pass. Yeah. And, and is that because if they were just ignoring her, would she be reacting at them on the same side of the street? Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, which is a very similar situation to what you described. If you need to pick your kid up to go take them to their room or something, right? Uh, quick burst of energy, right, that the dog wants to control. And dogs generally try to do that, obviously, by... Um, by nipping or jumping or doing those types of things. And anytime a dog is on a leash, those behaviors look 10x worse, obviously, because they're held back, right? So there's a lot more intensity behind it in those situations. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it still sounds very, very straightforward, you know, as far as kind of what you're, what you're describing to me. And, and, and again, all of those kind of still being more of the symptom of the issue, which is just in general, right, around distractions, around things that are more high energy, stuff like that. We just don't have enough control over the dog, right? So she's resorting to needing to handle these situations on her own that she gets uncomfortable by and she's just learning very inappropriate ways to do that obviously yeah the the one issue just pertaining to the daycare related topic i always tell everybody is training is not so much a thing you like do to the dog and then the dog is trained and then you can take them back any of those places and the dog won't rehearse those types of behaviors training really is like a communication system and an understanding of what does the dog need in order to be successful right so unfortunately when it comes to like boarding kennels daycare kennels Panels, things like that, you are to some extent kind of at the mercy of the knowledge of the person that's watching the dog as far as how well the dog is going to behave. Like I can get this dog to a place where, you know, you guys will know how to introduce this dog to new people, right? How to introduce this dog to new dogs, how to make sure you're intervening if there's problems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but unfortunately, unless those other people know really specifically all those types of things, there's only so much that you could actually do about it.
right? Um, so some of that comes down to just finding a good place that you know and trust. And generally, you want to find somebody that has a little bit more of a degree of knowledge on like training or, or the type of training you've done uh, that's going to be able to, to kind of understand what your dog needs, you know? And unfortunately, <laughs> Columbus is a little tricky because there's there's a lot of boarding and, and daycare kennels and stuff like that. But like from a philosophy standpoint, I would say a lot of them um, um, aren't, aren't as knowledgeable as, as they probably could be in this kind of avenue. <laughs> All right, guys, it's fucking winter again. We're in Cleveland, Ohio. It's April 16th right now. And yesterday it was like 85 degrees out. And today it's literally freezing out. So today we're making a video on why I have this stupid leash. Look at this thing, this flexi, it's retractable. We dog trainers hate these things. They tangle people up. They let dogs do annoying shit all the time. But why am I using it? What is the benefit of using this here flexi lead? And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So listen, we have this like stigma against flexi leads, obviously very rightfully so, that we hate them, right? And the reason why we hate them is not because the tool itself is faulty, right? The reason why we hate them is because of, generally speaking, the people that use them, right? You can see case in point here. What does everybody do? They do what I'm doing right now, which is you just let everybody get all freaking tent. Don't chew my flexi lead though, Josie. Don't do it. They, they do what I'm doing right now, which is they let the dog do literally whatever the actual fuck that they want to do with no regard for anybody else and they tangle themselves and others up and uh, it just becomes a goddamn mess. So what I'm gonna try to do right now is get myself untangled from Paige. Here, check this out, you ready? Go ahead and step out of it. <laughs> it's literally... It's <laughs> Yo, so that's literally right there. That's why people hate flexi leads, right? So today I wanna talk about what is, what is responsible flexi leading look like? Because I feel like there's kind of a trend right now in dog training of people starting to use flexis again. And guess what I did? I hopped on Amazon and I bought myself a couple flexi leads to see what all the hype is about. And here's the thing, as of like, this is like day two of me owning a flexi lead. I've never actually owned one of these in my life before. I don't hate it as much as everybody says that you should hate it, right? So we want to talk about responsible flexi lead ownership. Now, what are some possible places a flexi lead could be cool? Well, first and foremost, on a day like today, if I was far enough away from Paige where she couldn't get tangled up, I could have this totally open, this flexi lead, excuse me, I'm, bur I'm burping like crazy right now. This flexi lead has a 26 foot radius, right? So I could essentially pretend this dog is on a long line and I could practice all my off-leash recalls and walking skills, and I don't have to worry about this leash getting tangled up on anything other than <clears throat> if they get wrapped around Paige, right? So I could do this and not have to worry about looping that leash around and getting knots in it and dragging all over the ground and getting dirty and getting tangled up on the dog's feet or anything like that. And I have the ability, obviously, to practice my recalls and my come commands just like that. What else can I do with it, right? I could work on my off-leash healing in very distracted environments in a safe and controlled way. So that's what we're gonna kind of demonstrate today here is how exactly we would go about doing that, right? So this dog knows a come command. So what I'm gonna do in a second here is I'm gonna go ahead and give that come command. Josie, come. And then I'm gonna start enforcing my walking with my dog and I'm gonna try to avoid hitting this lock button and see if I can get her, no, come. Staying in position on her own as if there were no leash on her, right? And this gives me the ability to see all of the mistakes that I generally would see if the dog was not on a leash, but I have the ability to lock this in at any point if I start really losing control of situations. So it's essentially a long line, but if I were doing this with a long line, I would have to have the entire leash dragging, which would get very difficult for me to be able to then apply tension if I need to, where let's say hypothetically I turned, and I quickly needed to apply tension because a car was coming or whatever it may be, instead of reeling up 20, 25 feet of leash, I could literally just lock the button for a second, then unlock the button, right? 
So what we're doing is we're enforcing our off-leash healing with kind of the luxury of not having to fumble around with so much leash. So that's from the trainer standpoint, some benefits that I could see case in point, right? We got a car coming in. So what I'm gonna do temporarily is I'm gonna lock this in so that now the dog can't get super far away from me. And then once that car or that distraction passes, I could unlock it again. So getting back to, those are the trainer uses of this, right? So this just makes it a little easier for me to be able to enforce some of the things that I ultimately need to enforce. So from an owner standpoint, what are some things that we could do? Good job. From an owner standpoint, if you look at a lot of common things that we're needing to coach people on when it comes to leash walking skills with their owner, a lot of it has to do with pretending the leash isn't there, right? Most people, their go-to when they're leash walking their dog is joystick the dog around all over the place. We'll see they'll hold the leash all funny like this. They need to feel the constant tension at all times. They're constantly holding the dog back. If the dog gets ahead, they're using the leash before they use the e-collar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And they're holding the leash too short in general where the dog can't make the mistakes that they need to make, obviously, so you can correct for them. The flexi lead puts you in a position where you can get them out of that state of mind because if the dog starts getting ahead and my instinct is pull back, I can't pull back, <laughs> right? So what that forces me to do is let the dog make the mistake so I can correct for it. So once I've gotten past those issues on the flexi lead, no, come. Once I've gotten past those issues on the flexi lead and I put a regular leash in their hands, they're much less likely to do that because we've broken that habit or that pattern. It's literally fucking snowing out right now. This is insane. So again, this is literally day two of me being a, uh, a, uh, a responsible flexi, this is insane a responsible flexi lead uh, owner at this point, but I can see a lot of potential uses for this where I think it's gonna be a good tool to have in the toolbox when working with a lot of dogs, right? A couple downsides to it that some people have mentioned obviously is one, you gotta be very careful what kind of flexi lead you're getting because they're not gonna be as strong as a regular leash is gonna be. So these particular flexi leads, these flexi giants are rated up to like 150 pounds. So if a dog was really pulling or anything like that, it's not gonna snap on me where some of the cheaper ones, they're, they're not as reliable as that obviously. Other downsides, there's constantly a teeny tiny bit of tension on the leash. Now it's very minimal and I think it can be argued that a leash dragging on the ground or a long line dragging on the ground is gonna be roughly the same amount of tension as that would be, but nonetheless, something you wanna be aware of, obviously. And two, you can't be as kind of touch and go with your pressure as you can with a regular long line because you got this bulky thing you gotta handle, obviously. So, like I said, I, th I think I like it so far. I think there's a lot of benefit to it. Um, and it's something that I'm gonna be playing around with quite a bit over the next, uh, next couple of weeks here as we work with dogs to see if it kind of helps fine tune some things. Like even this, right? So she's starting to trip me. And generally people would use that leash to pull the dog out of the way. But I'm gonna see if when she trips me, if she keeps trying to go that way or not to actually correct for the unwanted behavior, if that's the case. No, come. Again, on that turn, because we didn't have the flexi engaged, she was able to get 15 feet away from me very quickly without realizing it, where if she were on a short six foot leash, that leash would have stopped her from making that mistake and she never would have actually learned that individual lesson there at that point. So we'll see even as we take her inside here, I'm gonna to try to avoid locking this if I can, simulating off leash walking through the facility. Come. 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 Good. Come. So that's responsible flexi ownership 101. Two days of progress. And when I say progress, I mean two days of me experimenting with it. And I kind of like it so far. So we'll see. We'll see how much I use it. I don't know. You see just the ability to 
see mistakes that you would not see if you were constantly working the dog on a leash and without the added benefit if the dog were truly off of a leash of having that quick and easy guidance to give them. <clears throat> now additionally, this is a good test. No, bed. So obviously because it has just a teeny, no, bed, tiny bit of tension on it. Obviously you could tell she wants to move with that. No, bed. No, bed. And I'm not actually correcting her for any of this. I'm just helping her back on. So we're using the negative, no, bed. Punishment of not getting the reward to reinforce right now. Ah, no, bed. And what this allows us to do is something we used to do in sport training quite a bit, which is opposition reflex training. So we would put the dog in position. We would actually apply a teeny tiny bit of tension like this. Good. And if the dog stayed true to the command that it is that we're trying to get them to do, we would reinforce that. So we're teaching them just because you feel that tension doesn't mean that it's necessarily a cue for you to get up when you're at this stage in your training. Good. Okay. We'll try and do that again here. Bed. Good. Good. Okay. Josie, down. Good. Okay. Josie, down. Good. Okay. Josie, down. Good. Okay. That's how you teach it down in fucking 10 minutes. Come on. Josie, bed. Good. Look at that. That's what we call responsible flexi ownership. Look at those ears. <laughs>